everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm Punita Kumar Sinha, Chairperson in CRED AMC. In today's special series, we will discuss a very important and current topic, how investors and companies are monitoring ESG. For this discussion, we are honored to have two very special guests today, Mitali Prasad and Amit Sinha. A brief introduction of both our guests. Mitali Prasad is a portfolio manager on the large cap core, small cap, and mid cap and growth and income strategies at Trillium Asset Management, which has been at the forefront of ESG thought leadership for nearly 40 years. Mitali has over 27 years of experience as a portfolio manager and equity analyst. She has also served on the CFA Society Boston's Responsible Investing Committee, as well as the chair of its Value Investing Committee. Amit Sinha is the Chief Strategy Officer for Mahindra Group. His portfolio also includes sustainability at the Mahindra Group level. He's a member of the Mahindra Group Executive Board and a director on several Mahindra Group companies. Prior to joining Mahindra, Amit was a senior partner and director at Bain for 18 years. Welcome Mitali and Amit. Mitali, my first few questions are to you. You've been investing using ESG metrics for over five years, and your firm Trillium Asset Management has been on the forefront of ESG. Can you tell us what ESG metrics you're using for evaluating companies before investing in them? And between the E and the S and the G, what gets more attention? Sure. Well, thanks again, Punita, for having me, you know, be a part of this discussion. And, you know, I'm delighted to be here today. So for us, I think maybe just to even take a step back, you know, for us, when we look at ESG, you know, it's more than just a signal to say that we feel good about investing in a company. And really, it, you know, we think about it as being attributes that are really too costly for investors to ignore. So at put as you know, at a portfolio manager at Trillium, we are fully integrating these ESG criteria into all of our investment analysis and decision making process. And by doing so, we think we can identify material risks, um, identify opportunities that the market hasn't fully or effectively priced into the valuation of these companies. And as you mentioned, I mean, these factors that we're looking at could be along the environmental pillar, the social pillar, or the governance pillar. And in terms of kind of what are the specific metrics, as you can imagine, you know, the, the key performance indicators, as we like to call them, really vary by industry. And we typically conduct materiality reviews in order to determine which issues are most material to each industry. So I can definitely get into more of that in detail, but really, at the core of it, what we are looking at is, you know, what are the financial risks or financial concerns that we should be prioritizing, as well as looking at what the stakeholder concerns are. So in this case, we're not just thinking of the shareholder, we are looking at the entire ecosystem that the company is involved in. And that could include its, you know, the obviously the employees includes its supply chain, it includes the communities that the company kind of lives in. Um, so again, just being really cognizant of all of the concerns that the stakeholders have as well, that helps us prioritize what issues will be relevant to you know, what industry. Um, and then again, in terms of what weights we assign to each of those pillars, again, that is very industry specific, but by and large, I can, you know, for example, give you an example of, for, um, say for a drug company, we could say that access to medicine is more relevant, right? Um, and, you know, for a waste management um, company, we could talk about, you know, what, how are they disposing of that, uh, you know, the, the waste that they collect, for example, so life cycle management becomes more important, you know, air emissions and greenhouse gas emissions could be relevant for a lot of different industries as well. And then again, issues such as if you think about board quality, board, you know, diversity, gender, equality and gender pay equity, you know, some of those issues I think are pertinent across most of the industries. So I'll leave it at that, you know, it is very specific, like I said, for specific industry groups, and we do a lot of proprietary work, you know, in coming up with what metrics we're looking at, you know, when we're looking at these companies. So hopefully that helps, but I can, you know, obviously answer any more questions that you have. No, that's great. Um, but, you know, since we have Amit uh, also, on the discussion today, and he's representing Mahindra Group. Uh, it may be helpful to hear from you, Mitali, um, how you look at, say, the auto sector. 
And then we can go to Amit and see how, you know, Mahindra Group is uh, preparing itself for that. Sure. So let's start off, you know, maybe, in, you know, with the auto group, I think if you think about for this, this kind of industry group, one of the key things we are looking at, you know, what is the kind of sustainability in the product offering that they have, right? So for an auto company, I think really understanding, you know, what is their commitment to maybe electrification of their fleet, you know, and it doesn't really just have to be EVs, but it could be other green initiatives around that. So that specific uh, criteria would really fall under their, you know, the environmental pillar. Um, then the other, uh, you know, issues that we are looking at also uh, would be, for example, product, you know, quality and safety, right? And that's kind of an issue again that falls under maybe the social pillar is kind of what kind of, um, you know, if if they've had any issues around, um, you know, worker, um, you know, health and safety, but it could also then relate to the product itself, you know, while it's, you know, uh, out in the marketplace, right? And what kind of health and safety issues they have there. Um, we also would be looking at things around their supply chain. And I think that becomes very relevant for some of these auto companies as well, you know, really trickling down, you know, not just uh, to their primary suppliers, but really trying to kind of go to the source of a lot of the raw materials and, you know, to see whether or not the company has been able to put in place measures that kind of allow even their suppliers to adhere to some, you know, higher standards, right? And that could be around, you know, even things like bribery, right? I mean, that's that's a prevalent issue, you know, for example, in, you know, in a lot of these countries. So just really, you know, figuring that out. Um, and again, making sure that it really trickles down the supply chain. Um, things like, you know, waste management, you know, how are they, you know, dealing with some of that? how they deal with their you know end of life for their products that becomes a critical issue as well um you know labor management that's a key you know gov, you know social issue as well you know how are they i don't know if the you know labor is unionized but really looking to see you know what kind of policies are in place you know as they you know look across their workforce and not just really limited to the executive uh, you know management um, you know, governance, again, will be an important issue. And for that, we are looking for issues such as, you know, is the um, chairman and CEO role kind of separated out? Um, you know, what is the executive compensation like? And, you know, is that linked to any kind of sustainability targets? Um, what kind of diversity do we have, you know, on the board? You know how many women are there on the board and then just across the workplace you know what kind of maybe ethnic racial diversity you know gender diversity do we have so again you know i i've thrown out a lot of different criteria and i'm not expecting any company including you know uh amit you you know you with mahindra to have answers to all of these questions but this gives us kind of an indication of the kind of metrics we would be looking at when we start talking to a company, you know, for example, um, you know, when we start engaging and talking with a company, these were the kind of questions we would be asking them um, as well. Uh, no, no, um, that's very helpful. So Amit, now turning over to you, because the Mahindra Group, just like Trillium has been the forefront of ESG investing, Mahindra Group in India has been on the forefront of uh, taking e ESG initiatives. Um, so based Based on what Mithali has said, how would you say the Mahindra Group is positioned and placed on its ESG journey and how and what metrics are you really monitoring and holding management accountable for? So great, uh, great question, Pranitha and Mithali, great to hear your perspective as well. Uh, let me start with one um, uh, example uh, of uh, what we have done or what we are trying to do. Uh, Dow Jones just announced their World Index for Sustainability, DJSI. Um, and there were 5,300 companies that were assessed. Uh, 322 companies, roughly 6% made the cut. Uh, and only five companies from India made the cut. Two of them are from Mahindra Group. Mahindra and Mahindra, for the first time as an auto OEM, made the cut. Tech Mahindra, which is uh, the technology IT company, uh, seventh year running. And then the other three companies are Wipro, Infosys, and Hindalco. So the reason I give this is a, it's a world index. It's not an India-specific uh, index. Uh, it just demonstrates the focus on um, uh, at least the ESG, the E part of the ESG. And auto OEMs, by design, 
are, uh, are, are looked at very differently given the kind of uh, engine, the kind of vehicles we produce. And the shift to EV is happening, but it's far from where, uh, where it will be uh, in the next five, five years or maybe 10 years. So as we look at uh, our own ESG um, uh, aspiration, it starts from, uh, from the top. Um, you know, it's it's very seldom you see uh, somebody who does strategy also doing sustainability. This is the first for any company in India because now we think that strategy and sustainability are two sides of the same coin going forward. ESG uh, is part of our global strategy narrative that we want to be a global leader in ESG, not only in our business decision, but also how we shape the narrative at the global level. So it's becoming one of the most important criteria. Now, how we reflect that in our business is quite uh, quite interesting, and you'll have to break that into E, S, and G. Uh, and I'll keep the G part short because Mahindra has been known for one of the most, uh, from a governance point, to be a gold standard from all along, uh, for, for all along. And then many of the things that Vitali touched upon, uh, CSR, the S part, uh, the social part in ESG, is something that we have done for you know 75 years, right? You know, and one of our programs is 35, 40 years, which is organized. How do we help uh, the girl child uh, education? It's called Nani Kali. So it's a very well mature program. I've done it from, for, from the inception. But I think lately the E part has received a lot of attention. Um, and the E part is reflected in three specific ways. Um, what we are doing with our business operations, so scope one, scope two, uh, emissions, even scope three. Uh, how we are changing ourselves as a portfolio, like how we're getting into solar and uh, recycling and circular economy. And then the last part is how are we actually demonstrating the thought leadership to uh, manage some of the things that you talked about, Mithali, for example, if you want to use low carbon steel in our vehicle manufacturing, it's not easy because there's no supply and there's no guarantee of supply for the next five, 10 years. So even if you want to pivot to a low carbon steel or, or recycle plastics, I think the, the, eco, the ecosystem is not ready. So what we have done, Punita, to your question is, yeah, we put it this together and say, hey, what are our top 10 commitments that we have on the ESG uh, and how are we going to measure our prog progress regardless of um, how the investor community with your spec Mithali looks at it because we want to be a global leader. We want to think ahead of the market. There is a reason why Mahindra acquired and participated in electric vehicle company, uh, electric vehicle uh, sector through Reva from 2010 onwards. So we, we've, we've always thought of staying ahead. Uh, in, in, in this direction. So those 10 commitments are, seven of them are E-specific, and I'll just you know mention a couple of them. Um, zero waste to landfill is a big commitment. Um, how do we make sure that all of our 90 sites are zero waste to landfill certified? Today, we have already covered 25 out of them. India's first zero waste to landfill certified facility is Mahindra and Mahindra. How can we water positive company? So in today, uh, in many of our plants, uh, we don't use municipal water 200 days a year. So we are able to harvest water that comes to us. We are able to recycle and reuse that water. We are signatory and have making a huge progress on RE100 using renewable energy. And by end of this financial year, which is March end, we'll be close to 45, 50% of our auto plant using renewable energy. We are, you know, we are significantly pushing EP100, which is energy productivity 100. That is... Uh, how do we use less energy to produce a vehicle? Uh, today, we take 67% less energy to produce a vehicle than eight years ago. In fact, one of our plant, Chakan plant, um, you know, which makes engine, uh, produced uh, an engine with 100% less energy in four years, which was supposed to be a 25 year target. We are planting 5 million, planning to plant 5 million trees by 2025 per annum. We are at 1, 1 million per year. On the girl child and on the woman education, these are our social goals. And then we have on the governance side, continue to push the boundaries on governance, transparency, and, and diversity. So those are the 10 um, you know, commitment that we have made just to stay ahead of what anybody is doing in ESG. And we measure ourselves on a, on a quarterly basis, but on a monthly basis internally, quarterly we report on a monthly basis, we are actually uh, managing our strategy and our sustainability and ESG efforts uh, much more frequently. So let me pause. Uh, hopefully it gives you a broader and you know, somewhat directional idea of how we are thinking about ESG and the metrics and how we are shaping ourselves. Uh, I'm glad you talked about measuring because one of the things that um, I find, and I'm on lots of boards as well, 
is that um, a lot of the um, journey on ESG and the measurement seems to be more of qualitative nature and um, at least by companies uh, and when they present to their boards. But uh, when investors look at it, I think they look a lot more at quantitative investors. And I'd like to get Mithali's view on how much of what you look at is qualitative and how much of what you analyze is quantitative. Sure. Um, so I guess that's that's an interesting question. And I think that's an ongoing kind of um, dilemma in this whole industry is, you know, where is the data coming from and who's reporting the data and how are they reporting the data? Um, you know, and is there any kind of standardized data that is available? Um, so that continues to be an ongoing issue. And as I've mentioned, you know, at Trillium, uh, since we've been doing it, you know, pretty much, you know, ESG kind of investing since 1982, we do have a lot of our own proprietary kind of databases where we have been collecting, you know, a lot of uh, data over the years on different industries, different companies. Having said that, definitely the amount of data that is now available through, you know, standardized providers, let's say like, a, you know, MSCI, Bloomberg, you know, um, Sustain Sustainalytics, et cetera, they're all providing a lot of kind of quantitative data as well. What is the source of that quantitative, quantitative data is really some of these companies which need to go in and start reporting on that. And I think when you start really digging in into that, what you realize is that there are a lot of blanks that a lot of companies, you know, when they talk about carbon emission reductions and, you know, net zero goals, et cetera, they're still not reporting on, you know, exactly what they're doing right now, you know, what their emissions are as of now. And, you know, so it's great to talk about targets, but if you don't have the data and the trend data to back it up, it's very difficult for us to measure it. So it, it kind of remains that balance. We definitely are seeing an increase, like I said, you know, of, of more data, uh, you know, I would still say that, you know, qualitative kind of metrics factor in and we try to kind of, you know, uh, reduce that bias of just being very subjective by really digging in and, you know, having conversations with the companies, digging through not only the company reports, but also, you know, there are NGOs, there are other kind of government websites um, that also offer a lot more information. And, and then, you know, the, the quantitative part of it is really done, you know, from our end, when we start scoring that data and really deciding, you know, as we talked about earlier, like what weights do we assign to what metrics? And if there are data streams that are missing, you know, you don't end up weighting those too heavily, but at the same time, you will ding that company because they have that missing data, right? So it's, it's kind of an ongoing game. It's just like, uh, Punita, I think back to when we look at you know, on the financial kind of the due diligence when we do that. Yes, there is a quantitative set of data that we are, you know, analyzing and looking at. And of course, that's much more standardized, but there is also a subjective element and a qualitative element that goes into kind of evaluating the management team or, you know, evaluating the other business aspects of the company. So I think, you know, ESG still, even though we've been doing it for so many years, it's still kind of in the early stages of really reporting and standardizing the data. We are moving in that direction hopefully quicker, uh, you know, hopefully that move comes quicker, but, you know, definitely um, still not quite there yet in terms of standardization. So Mitali, another follow-up question to you, because Amit talked about the Dow Jones sustainability indices and uh, Indian companies actually are very focused on trying to get into the Dow Jones sustainability index. Um, and uh, from where you sit as an investor, how much weightage do you give to whether a company is in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index or not? Yeah, so again, I mean, like I said, it's it's not something that we are specifically focused on, right? Is whether or not the company makes it to that sustainability index, because if it does make it there, you know, there's with all of this movement towards ESG kind of from other investors as well, you know, in some ways, you know, you, you kind of, the value is already kind of recognized, I guess, is one way of looking at it. You know, at Trillium, when we are trying to dig into some of the companies, we're also trying to identify, yes, definitely the leaders, you know, like a Mahindra group, you know, as Amit kind of talked about, but we're also looking for companies which are ESG improvers. So it's not necessarily the fact that we want the company to be on the, you know, on those leading indices. We are also looking for companies that are actually making changes that could actually potentially lead them, you know, on these indices in the future, but you know the idea is that if you're able to catch them early, you know you can get more value hopefully from just 
you know, seeing that ESG improvement along with, you know, financial improvement in the company as well. Mm -hmm. So again, there's no specific one index that we want the company to be on. Having said that, there are a lot of our companies that we own, for example, in our larger cap products that will make it to, you know, a lot of these green lists and a lot of these green indices and, you know, sustainability indices, because those are the kind of companies at the core of what we're looking for are those kind of companies. So definitely it's, it's a positive, um, you know, but that is not the be all and end all from our perspective as investors, um, you know, when we're looking at companies. No, I think that's very, uh, very interesting. And I think something that I think Indian companies should, uh, you know, uh, think about because a lot of their efforts are going into getting into the index. Of course, that means that they're uh, continuously improving to get into that index. Um, but once they get into the index, then the question is what next? So, so Amit, what next from here for the Mahindra Group? You're already in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, but as Mitali talked about, um, they look for also improvements. So from where you are already in your journey, what improvements do you think the Mahindra Group is going to make on the ESG front and what metrics quantitative um, are going to be kind of measured and monitored um, uh, within the group? Yeah, no, very good. Uh, let me, we are going to take this to a totally different level, Punita. So let me just start with metrics and how we think about metrics. So, so you know, I'll give you some statistics which are very, very relevant for Indian context, but for developed markets will be slightly higher, in some cases more. The um, average food intake per capita per day is in India is 1.4 kilograms. Now, and I'll come to four metrics and you'll see, see the relevance of that. Average waste, solid waste generation, generated per capita per day in India is 570, 600 grams, 0.6 kilos. Average water consumption per capita per day in India is 135 liters, right? Rural much lower, metros much higher, developed countries much, much higher. The average carbon emission per capita per day in India is five kilos. So we eat 1.4 kilos, 600 grams of waste generation, 135 liters of water used, most of that is not recycled. Five kilos of carbon that is generated. And we multiply all these numbers with 1.4 billion you're talking about a huge, huge uh, challenge that we're creating for the environment, right? And at Mahindra, we started to think about these metrics rather than any of the other uh, metrics. So, you know, how do we actually reduce the carbon emission per Mahindra employee? How do we actually reduce water consumption and increase the recyclability of water consumption per Mahindra employee? How do we reduce the solid waste generated and it's linked to ZWL zero waste to landfill, um, how do we reduce that? And for industrial company, that's a large undertaking, right? So how we are thinking about is look at all these metrics which are hurting the planet, the sustainability index, and let's address them individually and collectively. So that's our primary effort. And that's how we're shaping all our ESG specific uh, metrics. All we discuss is, hey, what's your, you know, this business, how much carbon are you generating per employee? Now, how should we reduce it? What's your roadmap? So where were you in 2019, where you are in 2021, and where will you be in 2025? So that's the first dimension that we are starting to do. We have done it in the past, but I think given, uh, given the importance of this and as we are bringing a lot more strategic elements into our sustainability and similarly in our CSR and governance. Now, the second, second part, you know, where next is what your question was. I think we have roughly that's a 25 companies of significant size in our portfolio. We talked about two companies that made it to DJSI. There are many other companies that made it to Terracarta. There are Crystal and many other companies are actually doing great things. But I think for us, we will be able to achieve our goals um, if all the companies actually make it to that level, right? And each of them are signal like Mahindra Logistics, Mahindra Club, Club Mahindra, Mahindra Real Estate, Excelo, which is steel processing, obviously. There are many other companies that need to do a lot more work to get to that. And Mithali, to your point, these are the companies which are up and coming, doing the right thing, but they haven't made it, made it. Mm -hmm. But we are not doing it from making the cut, but we are doing it because it's the right thing for us to do. It aligns very well with our purpose and we want to do them because it just, uh, uh, you know, it, it gives us the comfort and confidence we'll get there. 
So hopefully I addressed your point, but I'm happy to elaborate on any specific uh, uh, elements. Uh, Mitali, your thoughts on how you uh, view this whole business responsibility um, reporting or the integrated reporting and uh, what your view is on this standardized government mandated CSR spends and women on boards and all these standardized metrics that are coming from the top. How is that going to impact how you view companies going forward? Sure. So I'll start off with the second question first and to say that, you know, the government mandates, if there are those mandates, which is, you know, it, it's great to have that and for companies to be able to follow that. And I think, you know, one woman on the board is great. Here in the US, we're also push, push, pushing for it's a 30% kind of, you know, you know, threshold number that we're looking at. So there's always, like I said, there's always ways to improve. You start off with one, but there's always ways to improve. I mean, just having that one woman on the board you know if you're just meeting those standards but at least good place to start right so i feel it's it's great to have some of those mandates the you know one percent csr kind of it's more the social spending i think that's that's again a great thing to you know be able to have those companies do i think to amit's point it's really you know how is it kind of evolving over time and is the company doing it just to meet the bare minimum you know and i think that's something that you'll have to evaluate as an investor for us you know, those are just kind of the bare minimum thresholds that we may be looking at at that point, right? Um, so I think, you know, all moving in the right direction, but always, you know, room for improvement and all of those. And for companies that are truly committed to sustainability, to some of looking at these ESG kind of metrics and really improving, not just for the sake of being able to report and kind of meet some government requirements, uh, or mandates, you know, mm -hmm. there is a way to kind of distinguish amongst those. And I feel as an investor, you know, where at Trillium, we are really integrating all our financial analysis and, you know, ESG analysis into one framework. We're not distinguishing between, you know, this or that, right? So in this case, it, it's just like when I'm thinking about, you know, financial metrics that are standardized. I mean, how do we distinguish between one company and the other? Then you really dig into what is behind the data. And you know where the management kind of, you know what their commitment is to some of these, you know ESG goals, and you know where are they, you know where are they in their journey of the evolution, you know towards kind of the higher standards. So I think it becomes more of that kind of qualitative measure. To that extent, you know any amount of reporting that is kind of out there, you know is of a benefit to the investor, right? And so you know if there are standardized outside bodies that are able to validate that data that the company is putting forward. As an investor, I feel more comfortable looking at, you know, those data sets to say, sure, I mean, it makes sense and somebody else is validating it versus a company internally just reporting it. Sometimes it really is just a matter of, you know, reporting and, and because once you start reporting, you know, people know kind of, you know, where you are, there's more questions to ask, there's more, you know, things that you can measure and hopefully, you know, then kind of grow from there. So how do you think Indian companies from what you're hearing today from Amit, and uh, what I told you about the government mandates, how do you how do you contrast that to what you're seeing in other countries and in the US? Um, how many companies are actually reporting on these measures? Because when I speak to some companies in Asia, I find that most of them, if you ask them, what is your CSR spend? Because they don't have any metrics mandated by the government. Yeah. They cannot really often even tell you the entire number. And what what are you seeing in the companies that you invest in? Yeah, so good question, uh, Puneet. So again, you, as you know, in the US, I mean, there are no real such mandates in terms of, you know, reporting or kind of, you know, again, CSR spending as you're talking about. Um, but so overall, though, I will see just from even, you know, the last few years of being in the industry, and I also look at small and mid cap stocks, what you're seeing is that even some of the smaller companies are now talking to talk, uh, starting to talk more about you know, um, ESG metrics, right? They're starting to put out some kind of uh, report on corporate sustainability. So they there are, you know, more of that reporting. I don't know the numbers specifically, um, you know, and, and to the extent that there are really no such mandates, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the companies that are doing it are doing it out of their own kind of, you know, because that's the direction they want to evolve to. And I think more or less, I think the one positive I will say is that, you know, definitely if you look at, um, you know, the, the EU, right, the European companies, they've always been further ahead in terms of, you know, where they are in that reporting, um, you know, around some of these ESG kind of metrics. Some of the better 
you know, US companies are also looking at that as a guideline and, you know, really kind of coming up to standard, even if there's no such mandate here in the US, you know, companies more and more are talking about kind of how do we figure out and how do we, you know, get to those higher kind of standards. So yeah, the percentage I would still say is kind of low and I don't actually have the numbers in terms of, you know, where they would be. So Vitali, you talked about uh, shareholder engagement. Um, and uh, uh, before I turn over to Amit on this, I wanted to ask you, do you do your shareholder engagement only after you've invested in a company or do you engage with the companies before investing, make sure they get better and then invest? Okay, that, that, that is a great question. So no, for us, let's say the way we kind of think about engagement is really, um, you know, it, it really starts typically when we invest in the company after we've invested in the company. So shareholder engagement for us, as I mentioned, is really an area that um, is very, you know, key to who we are at Trillium. And we actually have a shareholder advocacy team that works closely with all of the people, you know, the, the my colleagues in investments and research. And basically the idea is to help, you know, identify kind of what issue areas and which portfolio companies they need to prioritize. So it really is working with the companies that we own in our portfolio. Now, having said that, um, our dialogue and conversation with the companies on, you know, ESG issues starts even when we are thinking about investing in the company. You know, but we are not trying to have the companies change, you know, their metrics before we invest in them. Um, the idea is that we are looking at the companies, you know, kind of hopefully they are already, you know, somewhere along, uh, you know, ahead in their ESG journey. Uh, but, you know, like I mentioned that any company, however, you know, sustainable it may be, there's always room for improvement. So that's where our engagement team will kind of come in. And we identify, you know, what areas may be material to that, you know, for that company, what areas will have much more of a, you know, environmental or social impact just overall. Um, you know, we are trying to also figure out, you know, is this company going to be receptive? And, you know, if so, you know, what are the opportunities and what are the ways that we can actually get to a successful kind of, you know, path really to resolve some of these, you know, ESG kind of areas that they need to improve on. So, you know, it really is a combination of, you know, figuring out, um, you know, which areas then we prioritize um, based on, you know, what we hold in our portfolios. And, uh, and Amit, are you seeing increased shareholder activism and engagement from your investors? And how are the Mahindra Group companies getting ready to um, deal with this kind of activism and engagement? Uh, what are you doing proactively? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great, uh, great, uh, great uh, question for our kind of companies. So uh, let me answer this in, in three parts. Part one is uh, uh, the unlisted companies. We have a large number of unlisted companies that are looking to raise funds or go for you know, raising capital outside India, beyond, uh, uh, locally in India. Uh, but the way we have adopted our governance and let's say beyond the ENS part, this is government, we run a, most of our material unlisted company as if they are listed. So let me start with that. So that means we run them, you know, with independent directors on board, we have board processes, we have resolutions, everything is done like as if they are listed companies. So we, 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 we prepare ourselves ahead of any kind of fundraise, any kind of capital event that allows us to understand how the, you know, the shareholder expectations are and how the independent directors play a significant role in shaping them. Um, the the second part is for let's say listed entity right and uh, listed entities i would say that the engagement has changed significantly you know we're spending a lot more time to understand so i'm on the board of few companies um, and you know many times they've reached out to me directly saying that as a strategy guy what are your views and you know from a m, &M perspective which has taken many of these companies so there is a lot more discussion on terms of and addressing their issue, which I don't think existed a few years back. So there's a lot of openness um, or, or uh, inquisitiveness from the shareholder for the right reasons to know what's happening beyond just showing up for the board meeting or seeing the, the quarterly results. I think there's a lot more interest from their point. And we are, we are supporting that and saying that hey, we'll be as transparent, as open with you uh, in our ways of explaining what we are doing and why we are doing. 
and that has changed significantly in the last few. And then the third part is what are the business as usual activity that we are doing across all kind of shareholders. Uh, we are explaining to them that how we are measuring our um, ourselves across a few set of areas. Um, or do we have board related gaps that we are addressing? Uh, do we have diversity uh, related issue that we are you know, solving for? Um, remuneration related gaps, I think one of you mentioned about that. Uh, what additional disclosures can we bring in? What transparency can we bring in? In fact, we got a feedback that if you, we need to do our AGM uh, like two weeks earlier because this is, you know, we are doing our AGM much later than most of the companies. So even small, small things uh, which are very useful for us to do uh, are coming through this, uh, you know, stakeholder and shareholder engagement. And then we're also able to explain to them how we do things, how we do stakeholder governance, how we do and some of our governance processes, what we're doing at corporate level, ESNG, how we are shaping up the talent. So many of those things are becoming a lot more business as usual across many of our companies. And it's, I would say that um, that has changed our outlook. In fact, uh, you know, Punita and Rizal, you might be you know, impressed that you know, with the shareholder, we're sharing our tech strategy because a lot of value in the last five years has been captured by the tech leaders. And there is a perception that some of the old school traditional companies have missed the bus, but we are explaining that how we are actually, you know, changing ourselves to, you know, to catch up to some of the front runners. And that's a key part of explaining our potential strategy uh, in the technology lens. And uh, I'm on a couple of Mahindra Group's unlisted companies. So I would agree with you that you all definitely are making a significant effort uh, in this direction. Now, there's a lot to discuss. I'm sure we can go on. So I'm going to ask my final question to each of you. So to you, Amit, first, uh, what is the future of ESG going to look like according to you? Uh, I'll take you from Mahindra and Mahindra perspective, right? So um, I would say in two lines, I, we are going to push hard to accelerate our carbon neutrality by 2040 agenda to much earlier. Uh, and that's going to reflect in the choices we make for the business operations. It will look into the way we uh, we develop our portfolio for several years, like you know, many of the choices that we're going to make. And finally, the kind of contribution we want to make on the thought leadership side. So I think operations, portfolio, and thought leadership are going to be, I would say, accelerated significantly as we think about the next phase of ESG from a Mohindra perspective. And Mitali, what do you think the future of ESG is going to look like? And especially as more and more companies uh, start reporting better and better on ESG and more and more investors start taking ESG pretty much as mainstream investing. How are firms like Trillium and uh, ESG investors who have been at the forefront going to differentiate themselves? Sure, uh, great question. And I think so for me, the future of ESG investing truly is going to be, you know, a point where we are not really talking about ESG investing as a separate issue, right? That investors will be looking at companies kind of, as you mentioned, Punita, you know, as Trillium does in integrated fashion, saying that, you know, both ESG factors and financial factors need to be looked at in conjunction. And, you know, that's how one should be investing. And it really is not a question of whether or not ESG works or doesn't work, etc. So for Trillium, I think the how we continue to differentiate ourselves, I do feel is the fact that you know everybody at Trillium, it's you know this is really ESG thinking is embedded in our DNA, and that's how we've been investing, you know, through the years, um, and the shareholder advocacy piece of it, you know, our engagement with the companies, our desire to work with these companies, and you know, help them along kind of that ESG evolution, um, I think is really something that truly differentiates us, right? And I think that will continue to be, you know, uh, a very important part of who we are and you know what we do and i think like i said you know with the esg engagement it's going to be just across so many different metrics and you know in terms of you know enhancing both shareholder value you know enhancing stakeholder value you know that engagement and you know the ability to then nudge these companies to adopt you know more sustainable business practices you know that i think will still be the big differentiator for trillium mm -hmm. So Amit, be prepared for more shareholder engagement and activism as we are already beginning to see in India. And, and low cost capital, be prepared <laughs> for both. Uh. There you go. Well, <laughs> well,
Well, on this optimistic note, we will end our discussion today. Thank you so much, Mitali and Amit, for your time and excellent ideas. I'm sure our viewers will gain from your very valuable insights. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Punita and Amit, for this enjoyable discussion.